Chapter 2 of The Hill of Dreams by Arthur Mackin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Hill of Dreams, Chapter 2. Lucian was growing really anxious about his manuscript. He had gained enough experience at twenty-three to know that editors and publishers must not be hurried. But his book had been lying at Messrs. Bite's office for more than three months. For six weeks he had not dared to expect an answer, but afterwards life had become agonizing. Every morning, at post-time, the poor wretch nearly choked with anxiety to know whether his sentence had arrived, and the rest of the day was racked with alternate pangs of hope and despair. Now and then he was almost assured of success. Conning over these painful and eager pages in memory, he found parts that were admirable, while again his inexperience reproached him, and he feared he had written a raw and awkward book, wholly unfit for print. Then he would compare what he remembered of it with notable magazine articles and books praised by reviewers, and fancy that, after all, there might be good points in the thing. He could not help liking the first chapter, for instance. Perhaps the letter might come tomorrow. So it went, week after week of sick torture, made more exquisite by such gleams of hope. It was as if he were stretched in anguish on the rack, and the pain relaxed and kind words spoken now and again by the tormentors, and then once more the grinding pang and burning agony. At last he could bear the suspense no longer, and he wrote to Messrs. Bite, inquiring in a humble manner whether the manuscript had arrived in safety. The firm replied in a very polite letter, expressing regret that their reader had been suffering from a cold in the head, and had therefore been unable to send in his report. A final decision was promised in a week's time, and the letter ended with apologies for the delay and a hope that he had suffered no inconvenience. Of course the final decision did not come at the end of the week, but the book was returned at the end of three weeks, with a circular thanking the author for his kindness in submitting the manuscript, and regretting that the firm did not see their way to producing it. He felt relieved. The operation that he had dreaded and deprecated for so long was at last over, and he would no longer grow sick of mornings when the letters were brought in. He took his parcel to the sunny corner of the garden, where the old wooden seat stood sheltered from the biting March winds. Messrs. Bite had put in with the circular one of their short lists, a neat booklet, headed, Messrs. Bite and Company's Recent Publications. He settled himself comfortably on the seat, lit his pipe, and began to read. A Badden to Beat, a novel of sporting life by the Honorable Mrs. Scudamore Ruddymead, author of Yoikes with the Mudshire Pack, The Sportly Stables, etc., etc., three volumes at all libraries. The press, it seemed, pronounced this to be a charming book. Mrs. Runnymede has wit and humor enough to furnish forth half a dozen ordinary sporting novels. Told with the sparkle and vivacity of a past mistress in the art of novel-writing, said the review, while Miranda of smart society positively bubbled with enthusiasm. "'You must forgive me, Aminta,' wrote this young person, if I have not sent the description I promised of Madame Lulu's new creations and others of that ilk, I must a tale unfold. Tom came in yesterday and began to rave about the Honorable Mrs. Scudamore Runnymede's last novel, A Bad to Beat. She says all the smart set are talking of it, and it seems the police have to regulate the crowd at Muddy's. You know I read everything Mrs. Runnymede writes, so I sent out Miggs directly to beg, borrow, or steal a copy, and I confess I burnt the midnight oil before I laid it down. Now, mind you get it, you will find it so awfully chic. Nearly all the novelists on Messrs. Bite's list were ladies. Their works all ran to three volumes, and all of them pleased the press, the review, and Miranda of Smart Society. One of these books, Millicent's Marriage, by Sarah Pocklington Sanders, was pronounced fit to lie on the schoolroom table, on the drawing-room bookshelf, or beneath the pillow of the most gently nurtured of our daughters. This, the reviewer went on, is high praise, especially in these days when we are deafened by the loud-voiced clamor of self-styled artists. 
we would warn the young men who prate so persistently of style and literature, construction and prose harmonies, that we believe the English reading public will have none of them. Harmless amusement, a gentle flow of domestic interest, a faithful reproduction of the open and manly life of the hunting field, pictures of innocent and healthy English girlhood such as Miss Sanders here affords us. These are the topics that will always find a welcome in our homes, which remain bolted and barred against the abandoned artist and the scrolophilus stylist. He turned over the pages of the little book and chuckled in high relish. He discovered an honest enthusiasm, a determination to strike a blow for the good and true that refreshed and exhilarated. A beaming face, spectacled and whiskered probably, an expansive waistcoat and a tender heart seemed to shine through the words which Messrs. Bight had quoted. And the alliteration of the final sentence. That was good, too. There was style for you if you wanted it. The champion of the blushing cheek and the gushing eye showed that he too could handle the weapons of the enemy if he cared to trouble himself with such things. Lucian leant back and roared with indecent laughter till the tabby tomcat who had succeeded to the poor dead beasts looked up reproachfully from his sunny corner, with a face like the reviewer's, innocent and round and whiskered. At last he turned to his parcel and drew out some half-dozen sheets of manuscript, and began to read in a rather desponding spirit. It was pretty obvious, he thought, that the stuff was poor and beneath the standard of publication. The book had taken a year and a half in the making. It was a pious attempt to translate into English prose the form and mystery of the domed hills, the magic of occult valleys, the sound of the red-swollen brook swirling through leafless woods. Daydreams and toil at nights had gone into the eager pages. He had labored hard to do his very best, writing and rewriting weighing his cadences, beginning over and over again, grudging no patience, no trouble, if only it might be pretty good, good enough to print and sell to a reading public which had become critical. He glanced through the manuscript in his hand, and to his astonishment he could not help thinking that in its measure it was decent work. After three months his prose seemed fresh and strange as if it had been wrought by another man, and in spite of himself he found charming things, and impressions that were not commonplace. He knew how weak it all was compared with his own conceptions. He had seen an enchanted city, awful, glorious, with flames smitten about its battlements, like the cities of the Sangral, and he had molded his copy in such poor clay as came to his hand. Yet, in spite of the gulf that yawned between the idea and the work, he knew as he read that the thing accomplished was very far from a failure. He put back the leaves carefully and glanced again at Messrs. Bight's list. It had escaped his notice that A Bat and a Beat was in its third three-volume edition. It was a great thing, at all events, to know in what direction to aim, if he wished to succeed. If he worked hard, he thought, he might some day win the approval of the coy and retiring Miranda of smart society. That modest maiden might, in his praise, interrupt her task of disinterested advertisement, her philanthropic counsels to go to Jumper's, and, mind you, ask for Mr. C. Jumper, who will show you the lovely blue paper with the yellow spots at ten shillings the piece. He put down the pamphlet and laughed again at the books and the reviewers so that he might not weep. This, then, was English fiction. This was English criticism. And farce, after all, was but an ill-played tragedy. The rejected manuscript was hidden away, and his father quoted Horace's maxim as to the benefit of keeping literary works for some time in the wood. There was nothing to grumble at, though Lucian was inclined to think the duration of the reader's catarrh a little exaggerated but this was a trifle. He did not arrogate to himself the position of a small commercial traveller who expects prompt civility as a matter of course, and not at all as a favour. He simply forgot his old book, and resolved that he would make a better one if he could. With the hot fit of resolution, the determination not to be snuffed out by one refusal upon him, 
he began to beat about in his mind for some new scheme. At first it seemed that he had hit upon a promising subject. He began to plot out chapters and scribbled hints for the curious story that had entered his mind, arranging his circumstances and noting the effects to be produced with all the enthusiasm of the artist. But after the first breath the aspect of the work changed. Page after page was tossed aside as hopeless. The beautiful sentences he had dreamed of refused to be written, and his puppets remained stiff and wooden, devoid of life or motion. Then all the old despairs came back, the agonies of the artificer who strives and perseveres in vain, the scheme that seemed of amorous fire turned to cold, hard ice in his hands. He let the pen drop from his fingers and wondered how he could have ever dreamed of writing books. Again the thought occurred that he might do something if he could only get away and join the sad procession in the murmuring London streets, far from the shadow of these awful hills. But it was quite impossible. The relative who had once promised assistance was appealed to, and wrote expressing his regret that Lucian had turned out a loafer, wasting his time in scribbling instead of trying to earn his living. Lucian felt rather hurt at this letter, but the parson only grinned grimly as usual. He was thinking of how he signed a check many years before in the days of his prosperity, and the check was payable to this didactic relative, then in but a poor way and of a thankful turn of mind. The old rejected manuscript had almost passed out of his recollection. It was recalled oddly enough. He was looking over the reader and enjoying the admirable literary criticisms, some three months after the return of his book, when his eye was attracted by a quoted passage in one of the notices. The thought and style both wakened memory. The cadences were familiar and beloved. He read through the review from the beginning. It was a very favorable one, and pronounced the volume an immense advance on Mr. Ritson's previous work. Here, undoubtedly, the author has discovered a vein of pure metal, the reviewer added, and we predict that he will go far. Lucian had not yet reached his father's stage, but was unable to grin in the manner of that irreverent parson. The passage selected for high praise was taken almost word for word from the manuscript now resting in his room, the work that had not reached the high standard of Messrs. Bight and Company who, curiously enough, were the publishers of the book reviewed in the reader. He had a few shillings in his possession and wrote at once to a bookseller in London for a copy of The Chorus in Green, as the author had oddly named the book. He wrote on June 21st and thought he might fairly expect to receive the interesting volume by the 24th, but the postman, true to his tradition, brought nothing for him and in the afternoon he resolved to walk down to Carmen in case it might have come by a second post, or it might have been mislaid at the office. They forgot parcels sometimes, especially when the bag was heavy and the weather hot. This twenty-fourth was a sultry and oppressive day. A gray veil of cloud obscured the sky, and a vaporous mist hung heavily over the land and fumed up from the valleys. But at five o'clock, when he started, the clouds began to break, and the sunlight suddenly streamed down through the misty air, making waves and channels of rich glory, and bright islands in the gloom. It was a pleasant and shining evening when, passing by devious back streets to avoid the barbarians, as he very rudely called the respectable inhabitants of the town, he reached the post office, which was also the general shop. "'Yes, Mr. Taylor, there is something for you, sir,' said the man. "'Williams, the postman, forgot to take it up this morning,' and he handed over the packet. Lucian took it under his arm and went slowly through the ragged winding lanes till he came into the country. He got over the first stile on the road and, sitting down in the shelter of a hedge, cut the strings and opened the parcel. The chorus in green was got up in what reviewers call a dainty manner, a bronze-green cloth, well-cut gold lettering, wide margins, and black, old-faced type all witness to the good taste of Messrs. Bight and Company. 
he cut the pages hastily and began to read. He soon found that he had wronged Mr. Ritson. That old literary hand had by no means stolen his book wholesale, as he had expected. There were about two hundred pages in the pretty little volume, and of these about ninety were Lucian's, dovetailed into a rather different scheme with skill that was nothing short of exquisite. And Mr. Ritson's own work was often very good. Spoilt here and there for some tastes by the cataloguing method, a somewhat materialistic way of taking an inventory of the holy country things, but for that very reason, contrasting to a great advantage with Lucian's hints and dreams and note of haunting. And here and there Mr. Ritson had made little alterations in the style of the passages he had conveyed, and most of these alterations were amendments, as Lucian was obliged to confess, though he would have liked to argue one or two points with his collaborator and corrector. He lit his pipe and leant back comfortably in the hedge, thinking things over weighing very coolly his experience of humanity, his contact with the society of the countryside, the affair of the chorus in green, and even some little incidents that had struck him as he was walking through the streets of Carmen that evening. At the post-office, when he was inquiring for his parcel, he had heard two old women grumbling in the street. It seemed, so far as he could make out, that both had been disappointed in much the same way. One was a Roman Catholic, hardened and beyond the reach of conversion. She had been advised to ask alms of the priests, who are always creeping and crawling about. The other old sinner was a dissenter, and Mr. Dixon has quite enough to do to relieve a good church people. Mrs. Dixon, assisted by Henrietta, was, it seemed, the Lady High Almoner, who dispensed these charities. As she said to Mrs. Colley, they would end by keeping all the beggars in the county, and they really couldn't afford it. A large family was an expensive thing, and the girls must have new frocks. Mr. Dixon is always telling me and the girls that we must not demoralize the people by indiscriminate charity. Lucian had heard of these sage counsels, and through it them as he listened to the bitter complaints of the gaunt, hungry old women. In the back street by which he passed out of the town he saw a large healthy boy kicking a sick cat. The poor creature had just strength enough to crawl under an outhouse door, probably to die in torments. He did not find much satisfaction in thrashing the boy, but he did it with hearty good will. Further on, at the corner where the turnpike used to be, was a big notice announcing a meeting at the schoolroom in aid of the missions to the Portuguese. Under the patronage of the Lord Bishop of the Diocese, was the imposing headline. The Reverend Merivale Dixon, vicar of Carmen, was to be in the chair, supported by Stanley Gervais, Esquire, J.P., and many of the clergy and gentry of the neighborhood. Signor Diabo, formerly a Romanist priest, now an evangelist in Lisbon, would address the meeting. Funds are urgently needed to carry on this good work, concluded the notice. So he lay well back in the shade of the hedge, and thought whether some sort of an article could not be made by vindicating the terrible yahoos. One might point out that they were in many respects a simple and unsophisticated race, whose faults were the result of their enslaved position, while such virtues as they had were all their own. They might be compared, he thought, much to their advantage, with more complex civilizations there was no hint of anything like the bite system of publishing in existence amongst them. The great Yahoo nation would surely never feed and encourage a scabby Hounum, expelled for his foulness from the horse community, and the witty dean, in all his minuteness, had said nothing of safe Yahoos. On reflection, however, he did not feel quite secure of this part of his defense. He remembered that the leading brutes had favorites who were employed in certain simple domestic offices about their masters, and it seemed doubtful whether the contemplated vindication would not break down on this point. He smiled queerly to himself as he thought of these comparisons, but his heart burned with a dull fury. Throwing back his unhappy memory, he recalled all the contempt and scorn he had suffered, 
As a boy, he had heard the masters murmuring their disdain of him and of his desire to learn other than ordinary schoolwork. As a young man, he had suffered the insolence of these wretched people about him. Their cackling laughter at his poverty jarred and grated in his ears. He saw the acrid grin of some miserable idiot woman, some creature beneath the swine in intelligence and manners, merciless as he went by with his eyes on the dust in his ragged clothes. He and his father seemed to pass down an avenue of jeers and contempt, and contempt from such animals as these. This putrid filth, molded into human shape, made only to fawn on the rich and beslaver them, thinking no foulness too foul if it were done in honor of those in power and authority, and no refined cruelty of contempt too cruel if it were contempt of the poor and humble and oppressed. It was to this obscene and ghastly throng that he was something to be pointed at. And these men and women spoke of sacred things, and knelt before the awful altar of God, before the altar of tremendous fire, surrounded, as they professed, by angels and archangels, and all the company of heaven. And in their very church they had one aisle for the rich and another for the poor." and the species was not peculiar to Carmen. The rich businessmen in London and the successful brother-author were probably amusing themselves at the expense of the poor struggling creature they had injured and wounded. Just as the healthy boy had burst into a great laugh when the miserable sick cat cried out in bitter agony and trailed its limbs slowly as it crept away to die. Lucian looked into his own life and his own will and he saw that in spite of his follies and his want of success, he had not been consciously malignant. He had never deliberately aided in oppression, or looked on it with enjoyment and approval, and he felt that when he lay dead beneath the earth, eaten by swarming worms, he would be in a purer company than now, when he lived amongst human creatures. And he was to call this loathsome beast, all sting and filth, brother." I had rather call the devils my brothers, he said in his heart. I would fare better in hell. Blood was in his eyes, and as he looked up the sky, seemed of blood, and the earth burned with fire. The sun was sinking low on the mountain when he set out on the way again. Burroughs, the doctor, came home in his trap, met him a little lower on the road, and gave him a friendly good night. Long way round on this road, isn't it? said the doctor. As you have come so far, why don't you try the shortcut across the fields? You will find it easily enough. Second start on the left hand, and then go straight ahead. He thanked Dr. Burroughs and said he would try the shortcut, and Burroughs span on homeward. He was a gruff and honest bachelor, and often felt very sorry for the lad, and wished he could help him. As he drove on, it suddenly occurred to him that Lucian had an awful look on his face and he was sorry he had not asked him to jump in and to come to supper. A hearty slice of beef, with strong ale, whiskey and soda afterwards, a good pipe, and certain Rabelaisian tales which the doctor had treasured for many years would have done the poor fellow a lot of good, he was certain. He half turned round on his seat and looked to see if Lucian were still in sight, but he had passed the corner and the doctor drove on, shivering a little. The mists were beginning to rise from the wet banks of the river. Lucian trailed slowly along the road, keeping a lookout for the stile the doctor had mentioned. It would be a little of an adventure, he thought, to find his way by an unknown track. He knew the direction in which his home lay, and he imagined he would not have much difficulty in crossing from one stile to another. The path led him up a steep bare field, and he was at the top the town and the valley winding up to the north stretched before him. The river was stilled at the flood, and the yellow water, reflecting the sunset, glowed in its deep pools like dull brass. These burning pools, the level meadows fringed with shuddering reeds, the long dark sweep of the forest on the hill, were all clear and distinct. Yet the light seemed to have clothed them with a new garment, even as voices from the streets of Carmen sounded strangely, 
mounting up thin with the smoke. There beneath him lay the huddled cluster of Carmen, the rugged and uneven roofs that marked the winding and sordid streets, here and there a pointed gable rising above its meaner fellows. Beyond, he recognized the piled mounds that marked the circle of the amphitheater, and the dark edge of trees that grew where the Roman wall whitened and waxed old beneath the frosts and rains of eighteen hundred years. Thin and strange, mingled together, the voices came up to him on the hill. It was as if an outland race inhabited the ruined city and talked in a strange language of strange and terrible things. The sun had slid down the sky and hung quivering over the huge dark dome of the mountain like a burnt sacrifice, and then suddenly vanished. In the afterglow the clouds began to writhe and turn scarlet, and shone so strangely reflected in the pools of the snake-like river that one would have said the still waters stirred, the fleeting and changing of the clouds seemed to quicken the stream, as if it bubbled and sent up gouts of blood. But already, about the town, the darkness was forming. Fast, fast the shadows crept upon it from the forest, and from all sides banks and wreaths of curling mist were gathering, as if a ghostly leaguer were being built up against the city and the strange race who lived in its streets. Suddenly there burst out from the stillness the clear and piercing music of the reveille, calling, recalling, iterated, reiterated, and ending with one long, high, fierce, shrill note with which the steep hills rang. Perhaps a boy in the school band was practicing on his bugle, but for Lucian it was magic. For him it was the note of the Roman trumpet, tuba mirum spargum sonum, filling all the hollow valley with its command, reverberated in dark places in the far forest, and resonant in the old graveyards without the walls. In his imagination he saw the earthen gates of the tombs broken open, and the serried legion swarming to the eagles. Century by century they passed by. They rose, dripping from the riverbed. They rose from the level, their armor shone in the quiet orchard. They gathered in ranks and companies from the cemetery, and as the trumpet sounded, the hill fort above the town gave up its dead. By hundreds and thousands the ghostly battle surged about the standard, behind the quaking mist, ready to march against the moldering walls they had built so many years before. He turned sharply. It was growing very dark, and he was afraid of missing his way. At first the path led him by the verge of a wood. There was a noise of rustling and murmuring from the trees as if they were taking evil counsel together. A high hedge shut out the sight of the darkening valley, and he stumbled on mechanically without taking much note of the turnings of the track, and when he came out from the wood shadow to the open country he stood for a moment quite bewildered and uncertain. A dark, wild, twilight country lay before him confused dim shapes of trees near at hand, and a hollow below his feet, and the further hills and woods were dimmer, and all the air was very still. Suddenly the darkness about him glowed. A furnace fire had shot up on the mountain, and for a moment the little world of the woodside and the steep hill shone in a pale light, and he thought he saw his path beaten out in the turf before him. The great flame sank down to a red glint of fire, and it led him on down the ragged slope, his feet striking against the ridges of ground and falling from beneath him at a sudden dip. The bramble bushes shot out long prickly vines, amongst which he was entangled, and lower he was held back by wet, bubbling earth. He had descended into a dark and shady valley, beset and tapestried with gloomy thickets. The weird wood noises were the only sounds, strange, unutterable mutterings, dismal, inarticulate. He pushed on in what he hoped was the right direction, stumbling from stile to gate, peering through mist and shadow, and still vainly seeking for any known landmark. Presently another sound broke upon the grim air. The murmur of water poured over stones, gurgling against the old misshapen roots of trees and running clear in a deep channel. He passed into the chill breath of the brook, 
and almost fancy he heard two voices speaking in its murmur. There seemed a ceaseless utterance of words, an endless argument. With a mood of horror pressing on him, he listened to the noise of waters, and the wild fancy seized him that he was not deceived, that two unknown beings stood together there in the darkness and tried the balances of his life and spoke his doom. The hour in the matted thicket rushed over the great bridge of years to his thought. He had sinned against the earth, and the earth trembled and shook for vengeance. He stayed still for a moment, quivering with fear, and at last went on blindly, no longer caring for the path, if only he might escape from the toils of that dismal, shuddering hollow. As he plunged through the hedges the bristling thorns tore his face and hands. He fell among stinging nettles and was prickled as he beat out his way amidst the gorse. He raced headlong, his head over his shoulder, through a windy wood, bare of undergrowth. There lay about the ground moldering stumps, the relics of trees that had thundered to their fall, crashing and tearing to earth long ago. And from these remains there flowed out a pale, thin radiance, filling the spaces of the sounding wood with a dream of light. He had lost all count of the track. He felt he had fled for hours, climbing and descending, and yet not advancing. It was as if he stood still and the shadows of the land went by in a vision. But at last a hedge, high and straggling, rose before him, and as he broke through it his feet slipped, and he fell headlong down a steep bank into a lane. He lay still, half stunned for a moment, and then, rising unsteadily, he looked desperately into the darkness before him, uncertain and bewildered. In front it was black as a midnight cellar, and he turned about and saw a glint in the distance, as if a candle were flickering in a farmhouse window. He began to walk with trembling feet towards the light, when suddenly something pale started out from the shadows before him and seemed to swim and float down the air. He was going downhill, and he hastened onwards, and he could see the bars of a stile framed dimly against the sky, and the figure still advanced with that gliding motion. Then, as the road declined to the valley, the landmark he had been seeking appeared. To his right there surged up in the darkness the darker summit of the Roman fort, and the streaming fire of the great full moon glowed through the bars of the wizard oaks, and made a halo shine about the hill. He was now quite close to the white appearance, and saw that it was only a woman walking swiftly down the lane. The floating movement was an effect due to the somber air and the moon's glamour. At the gate, where he had spent so many hours gazing at the fort, they walked foot to foot, and he saw it was Annie Morgan. "'Good evening, Master Lucian,' said the girl. "'It's very dark, sir, indeed.' "'Good evening, Annie,' he answered, calling her by her name for the first time, and saw that she smiled with pleasure. "'You are out late, aren't you?' "'Yes, sir, but I've been taking a bit of supper to old Mrs. Gibbon. She's been very poorly the last few days, and there's nobody to do anything for her.' "'Then there were really people who helped one another.' Kindness and pity were not mere myths, fictions of society, as useful as Doe and Roe and as non-existent. The thought struck Lucian with a shock. The evening's passion and delirium, the wild walk and physical fatigue had almost shattered him in body and mind. He was degenerate, decadent, and the rough rains and blustering winds of life, which a stronger man would have laughed at and enjoyed, were to him hailstorms and fire showers. After all, Messrs. Bite, the publishers, were only sharp men of business, and these terrible Dixons and Gervases and Collies merely the ordinary limited clergy and gentry of a quiet country town. Sturdier sense would have dismissed Dixon as an old humbug, Stanley Gervais, Esquire, J.P., as a bit of a bounder, and the ladies as rather a shoddy lot. But he was walking slowly now, in painful silence, his heavy, lagging feet striking against the loose stones. He was not thinking of the girl beside him, 
only something seemed to swell and grow and swell within his heart. It was all the torture of his days, weary hopes and weary disappointment, scorn rankling and throbbing, and the thought, I had rather call the devils my brothers and live with them in hell. He choked and gasped for breath, and felt involuntary muscles working in his face, and the impulses of a madman stirring him. He himself was in truth the realization of the vision of Carmen that night, a city with moldering walls beset by the ghostly legion. Life and the world and the laws of the sunlight had passed away, and the resurrection and kingdom of the dead began. The Celt assailed him, becoming from the weird wood he called the world, and his far-off ancestors, the little people, crept out of their caves, muttering charms and incantations in hissing inhuman speech. He was beleaguered by desires that had slept in his race for ages. "'I am afraid you are very tired, Master Lucian. Would you like me to give you my hand over this rough bit?' He had stumbled against a great round stone and had nearly fallen. The woman's hand sought his in the darkness, and as he felt the touch of the soft warm flesh he moaned, and a pang shot through his arm to his heart. He looked up and found he had only walked a few paces since Annie had spoken. He had thought they had wandered for hours together. The moon was just mounting above the oaks, and the halo round the dark hill brightened. He stopped short, keeping his hold of Annie's hand, looked into her face. A hazy glory of moonlight shone around them and lit up their eyes. He had not greatly altered since his boyhood. His face was pale olive in color, thin and oval. Marks of pain had gathered about the eyes, and his black hair was already stricken with gray. But the eager, curious gaze still remained, and what he saw before him lit up his sadness with a new fire. She stopped, too, and did not offer to draw away, but looked back with all her heart. They were alike in many ways. Her skin was also of that olive color, but her face was sweet as a beautiful summer night and her black eyes showed no dimness, and the smile on the scarlet lips was like a flame when it brightens a dark and lonely land. "'You are sorely tired, Master Lucian. Let us sit down here by the gate.' It was Lucian who spoke next. "'My dear, my dear,' and their lips were together again, and their arms locked together, each holding the other fast." And when the poor lad let his head sink down on his sweetheart's breast and burst into a passion of weeping, the tears streamed down his face, and he shook with sobbing in the happiest moment that he had ever lived. The woman bent over him and tried to comfort him, but his tears were his consolation and his triumph. Annie was whispering to him, her hand laid on his heart. She was whispering beautiful, wonderful words that soothed him as a song. He did not know what they meant. Annie, dear, dear Annie, what are you saying to me? I have never heard such beautiful words. Tell me, Annie, what do they mean? She laughed and said it was only nonsense that the nurses sang to the children. No, no, you are not to call me Master Lucian any more, he said when they parted. You must call me Lucian, and I... I worship you, my dear Annie. He fell down before her, embracing her knees, and adored, and she allowed him, and confirmed his worship. He followed slowly after her, passing the path which led to her home with a longing glance. Nobody saw any difference in Lucian when he reached the rectory. He came in with his usual dreamy indifference, and told how he had lost his way by trying the shortcut. He said he had met Dr. Burroughs on the road, and that he had recommended the path by the fields. Then, as dully as if he had been reading some story out of a newspaper, he gave his father the outlines of the bite case, producing the pretty little book called The Chorus in Green. The parson listened in amazement. "'You mean to tell me that you wrote this book?' he said. He was quite roused. "'No, not all of it. Look, that bit is mine.' And that, in the beginning of this chapter, nearly the whole of the third chapter is by me. He closed the book without interest, and indeed he felt astonished at his father's excitement. 
the incident seemed to him unimportant. "'And you say that eighty or ninety pages of this book are yours, and these scoundrels have stolen your work?' "'Well, I suppose they have. I'll fetch the manuscript, if you would like to look at it.' The manuscript was duly produced, wrapped in brown paper, with Messrs. Bite's address label on it, and the post office dated stamps. "'And the other book has been out a month.' The parson, forgetting the sacerdotal office and his good habit of grinning, swore at Messrs. Bite and Mr. Ritson, calling them damned thieves, and then began to read the manuscript and to compare it with the printed book. "'Why, it's splendid work! My poor fellow!' he said after a while. "'I had no notion you could write so well. I used to think of such things in the old days at Oxford. Old Bill, the tutor, used to praise my essays, but I never wrote anything like this. And this infernal ruffian of a Ritson has taken all your best things and mixed them up with his own rot to make it go down. Of course, you'll expose the gang. Lucien was mildly amused. He couldn't enter into his father's feelings at all. He sat smoking in one of the old easy chairs, taking the rare relish of a hot grog with his pipe, and gazing out of his dreamy eyes at the violent old parson. He was pleased that his father liked his book, because he knew him to be a deep and sober scholar and a good judge of good letters, but he laughed to himself when he saw the magic of print. The parson had expressed no wish to read the manuscript when it came back in disgrace. He had merely grinned, said something about boomerangs, and quoted Horace with relish. Whereas now, before the book in its neat case, lettered with another man's name, his approbation of the writing and his disapproval of the scoundrels, as he called them, were loudly expressed, and though a good smoker, he blew and puffed vehemently at his pipe. "'You'll expose the rascals, of course, won't you?' he said again. "'Oh, no, I think not. It really doesn't matter much, does it? After all, there are some very weak things in the book. Doesn't it strike you as young?' I have been thinking of another plan, but I haven't done much with it lately. But I believe I've got hold of a really good idea this time, and if I can manage to see the heart of it, I hope to turn out a manuscript worth stealing. But it's so hard to get at the core of an idea, the heart, as I call it. He went on after a pause. It's like having a box you can't open, though you know there's something wonderful inside— but I do believe I've a fine thing in my hands, and I mean to try my best to work it. Lucian talked with enthusiasm now, but his father, on his side, could not share these ardors. It was his part to be astonished at excitement over a book that was not even begun, the mere ghost of a book flitting elusive in the world of unborn masterpieces and failures. He had loved good letters— but he shared unconsciously in the general belief that literary attempt is always pitiful, though he did not subscribe to the other half of the popular faith, that literary success is a matter of very little importance. He thought well of books, but only of printed books. In manuscripts he put no faith, and the Paulo post-futurum tense he could not in any manner conjugate. He returned once more to the topic of palpable interest. "'But about this dirty trick these fellows have played on you. You won't sit quietly and bear it, surely. It's only a question of writing to the papers.' "'They wouldn't put the letter in, and if they did, I should only get laughed at. Some time ago a man wrote to the reader, complaining of his play being stolen. He said that he had sent a little one-act comedy to Burley, the great dramatist, asking for his advice.' Burley gave his advice and took the idea for his very own successful play. So the man said, and I dare say it was true enough. But the victim got nothing by his complaint. A pretty state of things, everybody said. Here's a Mr. Thompson that no one has ever heard of, bothers Burley with his rubbish, and then accuses him of petty larceny. Is it likely that a man of Burley's position, a playwright, who can make his five thousand a year easily, would borrow from an unknown Thompson? I should think it very likely indeed, Lucian went on chuckling, but that was their verdict. No, I don't think I'll write to the papers. 
Well, well, my boy, I suppose you know your own business best. I think you are mistaken, but you must do as you like. It's all so unimportant, said Lucian, and he really thought so. He had sweeter things to dream of, and desired no communion of feeling with that madman who had left Carmen some few hours before. He felt he had made a fool of himself. He was ashamed to think of the fatuity of which he had been guilty. Such boiling hatred was not only wicked, but absurd. A man could do no good who put himself into a position of such violent antagonism against his fellow creatures. So Lucian rebuked his heart, saying that he was old enough to know better. But he remembered that he had sweeter things to dream of. There was a secret ecstasy that he treasured and locked tight away, as a joy too exquisite even for thought till he was quite alone. And then there was that scheme for a new book that he had laid down hopelessly some time ago. It seemed to have arisen into life again within the last hour. He understood that he had started on a false tack. He had taken the wrong aspect of his idea. Of course, the thing couldn't be written in that way. It was like trying to read a page turned upside down, and he saw those characters he had vainly sought suddenly disambushed, and a splendid, inevitable sequence of events unrolled before him. It was a true resurrection. The dry plot he had constructed revealed itself as a living thing, stirring and mysterious, and warm as life itself. The parson was smoking stolidly to all appearance, but in reality he was full of amazement at his own son, and now and again he slipped sly, furtive glances towards the tranquil young man in the armchair by the empty hearth. In the first place, Mr. Taylor was genuinely impressed by what he had read of Lucian's work. He had so long been accustomed to look upon all effort as futile that success amazed him. In the abstract, of course, he was prepared to admit that some people did write well, and got published, and made money just as other persons successfully backed an outsider at heavy odds. But it had seemed as improbable that Lucian should show even the beginnings of achievement in one direction as in the other. Then the boy evidently cared so little about it. He did not appear to be proud of being worth robbing, nor was he angry with the robbers. He sat back luxuriously in the disreputable old chair, drawing long, slow wreaths of smoke tasting his whiskey from time to time, evidently well at ease with himself. The father saw him smile, and it suddenly dawned upon him that his son was very handsome. He had such kind, gentle eyes and a kind mouth, and his pale cheeks were flushed like a girl's. Mr. Taylor felt moved. What a harmless young fellow Lucian had been! No doubt a little queer and different from others— but wholly inoffensive and patient under disappointment. And Miss Deacon, her contribution to the evening's discussion had been characteristic. She had remarked, firstly, that writing was a very unsettling occupation, and secondly, that it was extremely foolish to entrust one's property to people of whom one knew nothing. Father and son had smiled together at these observations, which were probably true enough. Mr. Taylor at last left Lucian alone. He shook hands with a good deal of respect, and said, almost deferentially, "'You mustn't work too hard, old fellow. I wouldn't stay up too late if I were you, after that long walk. You must have gone miles out of your way.' "'I'm not tired now, though. I feel as if I could write my new book on the spot.' and the young man laughed a gay, sweet laugh that struck the father as a new note in his son's life. He sat still a moment after his father had left the room. He cherished his chief treasure of thought in its secret place. He would not enjoy it yet. He drew up a chair to the table at which he wrote, or tried to write, and began taking pens and paper from the drawer. There was a great pile of ruled paper there, all of it used on one side, and signifying many hours of desperate scribbling, of heart-searching and rack of his brain, an array of poor, eager lines written by a waning fire with waning hope, all useless and abandoned. He took up the sheets cheerfully and began in delicious idleness to look over these fruitless efforts. 
a page caught his attention. He remembered how he wrote it while a November storm was dashing against the panes. And there was another, with a queer blot in one corner. He had got up from his chair and looked out, and all the earth was white fairyland, and the snowflakes whirled round and round in the wind. Then he saw the chapter begun of a night in March. A great gale blew that night and rooted up one of the ancient yews in the churchyard. He had heard the trees shrieking in the woods, and the long wail of the wind, and across the heaven a white moon fled awfully before the streaming clouds. And all these poor abandoned pages now seemed sweet, and past unhappiness was transmuted into happiness, and the nights of toil were holy. He turned over half a dozen leaves and began to sketch out the outlines of the new book on the unused pages running out a skeleton plan on one page, and dotting fancies, suggestions, hints on others. He wrote rapidly, overjoyed to find that loving phrases grew under his pen. A particular scene he had imagined filled him with desire. He gave his hand free course and saw the written work glowing. The action and all the heat of existence quickened and beat on the wet page. Happy fancies took shape in happier words and when at last he leant back in his chair he felt the stir and rush of the story as if it had been some portion of his own life. He read over what he had done with a renewed pleasure in the nimble and flowing workmanship, and as he put the little pile of manuscript tenderly in the drawer he paused to enjoy the anticipation of tomorrow's labor. And then, but the rest of the night was given to tender and delicious things, and when he went up to bed, a scarlet dawn was streaming from the east. End of chapter 2